It can be a little lonely in the middle of a pandemic. I miss my students and colleagues in the teacher lounge. So this is absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Um, so I'll give you an overview of Synapse today. It's an acronym that represents seven different aspects of learning and memory that are important to keep in mind when facing academic challenges. And Synapse importantly provides a common language that can be really helpful when engaging kids in an ongoing dialogue about their learning process. Um, we use Synapse to also in introduce very specific learning strategies and tips that are associated with each aspect of learning and memory. And these are practical strategies that the kids can um, learn and practice in the classroom as formative assessments that measure both their content knowledge and study skills. So I'm a biology teacher and I tell my kids all the time that the biology I'm teaching them is essentially a prop. It's just a tool for them to learn how to learn and to develop these study skills. So when I was developing Synapse with the Tang Institute, I had two big goals. The first was that I knew it had to be memorable because as all teachers know, as you know, when kids are stressed or working alone at home, sometimes everything we've taught them that we think that they know could, flies out the window. Um, and this definitely applies to the remote learning that a lot of kids are doing right now, given um, the current pandemic. My second big goal was that I wanted a framework that was adaptable, something that teachers and students could make their own and to use as little or as more as they have time for or find useful. Okay, so I'm gonna turn on my screen sharing here. I see that I haven't done that yet. Um, let's go, okay. So today I wanna to focus on um, giving you an overview, but mainly the aspects of Synapse that are very um, good at boosting student agency, inclusion, and belonging in the room. Because science of learning can be really fun to do in the classroom. And so some of these strategies have really knit together um, the social emotional fabric in the classroom while teaching the kids a little bit about learning and memory. Okay, so Synapse keeps the focus on learning rather than teaching and supports what I call scientific learning in which kids apply the scientific method to their own learning process. And Synapse is there to support kids as they undergo this experimentation with different learning strategies, which can be really scary. So at the high school where I teach, we have a lot of high achievers. These are kids who were first in their class um, all over the country and all over the world um, in their middle schools. And often these kids um, can be hampered by their early success. So they can be very rigid learners because um, the study strategies they employed before maybe fair enough worked well for them. Um, but they can be very formulaic in their approaches to learning and they can cling to outdated methods. So when they bump up to high school, even when their old study strategies aren't working, um, they can cling to them and be less nimble than kids who have faced learning challenges. We also have kids um, who didn't really develop many study skills prior to coming to Andover. Um, their natural intelligence has allowed them to fly through their elementary school years. Um, but when they come here, some of their learning differences become unmasked for the first time in high school. But in either case, it can be really scary to step outside your comfort zone um, and do a little experimentation with different study methods. And it's often the last thing that kids want to do during periods of new academic challenge. So Synapse is there to support them by introducing practical steps that they can take to experiment with their own learning. Okay, I probably don't need to introduce this, um, this slide or James Nottingham in this crowd. He has popularized um, 
the learning pit and graphically um, depicted learning challenges, particularly deep learning, um, and has really changed the way that students and teachers think about learning challenges. Um, and we've gotten a lot better, you know, as educators, we've gotten a lot better at understanding the socio-emotional experience of the challenge and the cognitive conflict that kids face when they lose, when their confusion starts to outpace their clarity when they're learning something new. Um, and so Zaretta Hammond, um, James Nottingham, um, and others have um, taught us a lot about the impacts of stress on the brain um, and what can be going on with these kids who do, as Scylla pointed out, can sometimes appear passive, um, but are struggling with um, either a processing issue or some sort of um, emotional um, paralysis during their learning. So this pit can be broken down into four different stages. And usually when I'm working with teachers, I ask you to um, think about one learner. So think about, pause for a minute and think about one learner that you worked with this year or perhaps a cohort of learners that you are currently working with. Um, and as we go through these steps of the pit, maybe reflect on where those learners become hitched. So at the beginning of deep learning, there's stage one where a learner will um, reinforce the scaffold or the overall gist and understand a framework for what it is they're about to learn. And here, there's typically a great deal of clarity and very little confusion. But as they start to dig into the meat of a topic or a problem, confusion very quickly outpaces clarity, and hence the feeling of being in the pit with no clarity and all the confusion. In step three, um, or stage three, learners start to make meaning. Right? They start to construct meaning for themselves, and by step four, Eureka, they can go ahead and reflect on what they've learned, perhaps deepening their understanding or apply and transfer that knowledge to um, other disciplines or other problems. And so often where kids can get stuck is here, um, especially with our um, super high achiever kids or kids who are in a hurry to get their work done, they may dive into um, the meat of a topic before establishing a very clear framework and scaffolding for what it is they're about to learn. These are the eager beavers. Um, and some of the kids, as they dive through, I hear it all the time with my students saying they want to just get their work done or they've got a lot of work to plow through. Um, and so this is not a very efficient way to be learning. Um, and sometimes as those learners get into the heart of a topic or a problem, um, they can be quickly overwhelmed. Um, because they haven't taken the time to set up um, their learning in a meaningful way to engage that working memory, to lean on what they know. And so they end up here um, and have very little um, clue or um, knowledge um, or, you know, we've all taught them what to do to start to make meaning. But once they're stressed and upset and overwhelmed, we all know that there's not much that can much good that can be done from a tired and overwhelmed learner. And so this is where Synapse comes in to actually support those toeholds so the kids can start climbing out of their pit, um, gaining some of the clarity back, and, um, and then really exercise their new neurons by applying what they've learned. So this is where Synapse falls on the learning pit. Um, and what I'm going to do here is give you an overview. So it's a, it's a very short talk. Um, normally when I work with teachers, we'll spend a few hours going through each different step and the different aspects of learning and memory um, that are um, associated with each step and then some practical engagements for the classroom. But today what I'll do is I'll show you a 
learning um, an explainer video. It's about three minutes long and it gives you a nice over an overview. Sometimes the things we want to learn can feel just too big and we find ourselves stuck in a learning pit. Our job as students is to learn how to climb out, gaining confidence and knowledge that will make it easier the next time. By taking a scientific approach, experimenting with new study methods, and reflecting on our progress, we can all become better learners. Synapse is a simple set of strategies that are easy to learn and can help anyone lean into scientific learning and the climb ahead. Say you're learning about photosynthesis and things are getting a little too confusing. Try Synapse. First, simplify. Reduce the process to its core elements. It's important to strengthen your basic understanding of the process before trying to learn too many details. For photosynthesis, you might start with the word itself. Photosynthesis is how plants use light, photo, to put together, or synthesize, molecules they need to survive and grow. It's simple, right? It's a great start. Yes, activate your growth mindset. This may seem simple or silly, but it's actually the most important step. You need to believe in yourself and have the confidence to take on new and exciting challenges. That's what a growth mindset is all about. Narrate, convert what you're learning into a story. It's hard to remember dozens of facts, but it's really easy to remember a great story. Create an epic tale that weaves together the new information you're learning and share it with others. Who are the main characters? How do they interact? Where's the action, the drama? You'll remember concepts much easier this way. Associate. Connect new ideas to what you already know. No idea stands alone. Each lives in an ecosystem connected to a host of other ideas. Focus on the relationships between new concepts you're learning and those you already know. This will help you remember important facts and appreciate the big picture. Personalize. Relate what you've learned to your own life. Attaching new facts to personal experiences provides emotional weight they wouldn't otherwise have. This allows them to sink in and makes them much easier to remember. So ask yourself, why is this particular topic meaningful to me, my community, or environment? Sleep. Say yes to sleep. Sleep is necessary for newly learned ideas to consolidate or stick in our memory. It's more useful to study in relatively short sessions separated by sleep-filled nights than to stay awake all night cramming for a test. Exercise. Apply your new knowledge to real situations. Look for opportunities to retrieve and use what you've learned in your everyday life. Practice drawing, mapping, and storytelling to strengthen your understanding and memory. Synapse. These seven strategies will help you learn and remember information in a fun and effective way. You have a whole life of learning ahead of you, so lean into scientific learning with Synapse. Synapse was created by Christine Mo Sometimes. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> um, so we don't have a lot of time left, and um, this is meant to give a, a brief overview, but um, ways in which different types of learners can really adapt Synapse um, based on what kinds of supports they need the most is really, I think, the heart and soul um, the adaptability of this is its real strength. So if you take um, one sample step, the first S in synapse is simplify. Um, up here, for kids who do have attention challenges, which is every single teenager, I live with a teenager, and um, uh, social media and constant pinging of phones is just, um, you know, the bane of our existence. Um, up here, for attention management, um, there are a few uh, strategies, right? Um, down here, where there's really shifts over to processing and just extraction, often as a biology teacher, um, my kids will come to me and say, 
it's really hard to scaffold new learning when we're diving into a chapter or watching a video and it's hard to really even understand any of the language that's being used. And so they really need a lot of support to extract the main idea and to break down the complexity. Um, it's, you know, not turning on the bathtub, it's filling it one thimbleful of a, at a time. Um, and then for those kids who quickly become overwhelmed, considering their resources. Um, it often doesn't occur to kids to use a simpler text at the beginning of a year-long sequence and to grow into the textbook that they're using um, and to assess their stress level and consider whether or not they're being overwhelmed is actually playing into their ability to understand the material. Um, so I'm going to move through. Um, this is another example of ways that different learners will approach knowledge construction. Um, the A in Synapse is associate, right? Connecting new ideas to what we know. This is a chance to talk to kids about schema and their working memory and how much they're leaning into the schema that already exists in their brain to incorporate new knowledge into their knowledge base. And I often will start with kids to, um, with kids building simple concept maps. And so this is literally a concept map that I got from a kid and it made my head hurt, but this was their mental representation of what they were trying to learn that night. And I thought, this is way too much. So I was coaching them to break it down a little bit, maybe use a little color, different sized um, bins, different fonts. Um, they could also approach it graphically, right? Um, and so usually when we have kids build concept maps, they approach it very differently and they start to learn from one another. Um, personalize is really the special sauce. And I know I'm about into the time when we're meant to go to questions. So I think we'll probably be most, most questions about this step, um, which is really to what we want kids to do. We want them to relate what they're learning to their own life. Um, what I have my kids do at the beginning of the year is to take a simple character survey so um, that they can get to understand a little bit about their own character strengths and values that are important to them. And for an, um, by taking this 10 minute survey through the Character Institute, they can get a sampling or a readout, an assessment of what's meaningful to them. So for Skylar here, Skylar's a real cerebral kid, right? Um, judgment, love of learning, some humor, but prudence, self-regulation rated very high for Skylar. So he might approach learning in a more orderly, systematic, methodologic way um, Charlie, on the other hand, humor, curiosity, creativity, perseverance, great, zest. Um, Charlie might take a very different approach and synapse might mean something entirely different to Charlie, right? And the narratives that Charlie builds in the association maps Charlie puts together for learning, they might look entirely different from Skylar. But having them in the same room, celebrating that difference and learning to lean in to these character strengths while they're stepping outside their comfort zone, I think it's very important for kids to understand that if they're not approaching challenge by leaning into their own strengths, then not only are they outside their comfort zone in a very academic way, but they are in a social and emotional way as well. So to harness their strengths and to approach a learning challenge as girded in their own individuality and um, self-appreciation as possible really makes the biggest difference. Um, and, it, and it gets, it's very affirmative for the kids to celebrate who they are and to start sharing that. Um, and in this way, our school has worked um, very hard to build an intentionally diverse community of learners and um, we don't have a bunch of little cerebral cortices walking into our classroom. We have people with personal histories and difference. And the more that we can celebrate that 
and encourage the kids to share with one another, the more we knit together this, um, this diverse community. So in keeping with that same idea, um, asking the kids to explore the relevance of what they're learning as it pertains to their self, their family, their community, their culture, um, and to share what impacts what they're learning um, has on their community. It could be very different. As we pointed out, Scylla has elephants outside her, um, <laughs> outside her house, and, and we don't. And, but kids coming from a very different um, culture or community can see and interpret and view what they're learning very differently. And it can, it can mean something very different to them. And encouraging kids to share that as a, a powerful tool to boost their own learning um, is really the secret sauce and has changed our classroom um, in ways that, you know, you just can't really describe in words. Um, I'll end, you know, there's, uh, there are always kids, at, you know, even halfway through the year teaching advanced biology where they'll say, you know, Dr. M, I will never use this ever in my life. Um, and for those kids who have a really difficult time leaning into their personal strengths or um, for whom the relevance isn't immediately appreciable, what I do with them for personalized is to search for the you. So biology is the study of systems and there are only so many different types of systems in the world. And so the dialogue or the interaction among um, members of an ecosystem or molecules within a cell has to resemble something that they've seen before, perhaps um, bringing about an autobiographical metaphor that the kids can use to help them remember what it is they're, the fundamentals that they're trying to learn. And then of course, with these kids, we hope that the more they know, the more they will want to explore the relevance and find the topic interesting. But there's always a few, right? And that's why we love teaching. That's the challenge that keeps us going every day. Um, I wanna stop here because I'm hoping to receive some questions from the audience. I do have a web page here, Laboratory for Learning, where there's a whole lot more information for those of you who are interested. And um, as Felicia pointed out, I'm pretty easy to find online.